Have you ever read a book that just really deeply impacted you? It stayed with you. The character stayed with you. You had some sort of cathartic release or it grew your empathy. Uh, it just, it stays with you. It makes a lasting impression. So in this video, I want to share with you five classics that have done just that and give you an honest review of them. So let's get started. Hi there, welcome back and if you're new here, welcome. My name is Karen and we love to talk about books here at our house. And so before I get started, I'd love to hear from you. Comment down below, what is one book that has also just really impacted you? One of your favorites that you can read over and over again, because really it feels like they're your friends and you can always revisit them in the pages of those books. And maybe it's different each time you read it because you're different, you're in a different place. And so I believe that bibliotherapy is very real. And so I don't know what these books say about me that I'm going to share with you, but I'll just let you know why I enjoyed them so much. So let's get started. All right, so book number one, no secret, if you've been watching my channel for a while, is Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte, one of the Bronte sisters. This book was written in 1847. It was kind of controversial for its Victorian era time frame because the main character just kind of challenged the, you know, the societal norms of what a woman was like. I don't really see it that way though. Yes, yeah, she's very strong-willed and independent, but she's also very submissive, very forgiving, very kind, very merciful, and maybe not your traditional picture of what you know, a very feminine woman would be like or what her priorities or concerns would be. But you see how she's raised and where she's coming from, why she is the way she is. You see the cause and effect. So I don't want to give too much away in case you haven't seen it because I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, but the main character is Jane and she has a very sad upbringing. She's an orphan. She lives with her cruel aunt and cousins, ends up in... Um, a boarding house, orphanage, whatever you want to call it, there's a character there that she meets, Helen, that just always breaks my heart. And the quotes and the things that she says, it just really takes my breath away. Each time that I read it, I want to be like Helen. That's probably one of my favorite characters second to Jane. Now, Jane ends up as a governess at Thornfield Hall and falls in love with her employer, Mr. Rochester, but there is a big wedge between them that she doesn't find out until the day of their wedding. It's crazy, it's shocking to me. Usually I see things coming up the pike, like, okay, I kind of saw that coming, but this just really shook me, <laughs> it just surprised me. Uh, and the way that she handled the situation and left, wow, that's also a very sad, sad part. But then who she ends up living with, how that turned out in the end. And again, I don't wanna give away too much of the ending, but you know, it wasn't the plan A, but you see the beauty in the plan B or the plan C. And really it's just like up to the people, not the circumstances. The big theme that I see here is love and forgiveness, mercy. She always was so merciful, she forgave. And even when she goes to visit her dying aunt on her deathbed, who was still not repentant, and reveal this uh, shocking secret that would make anybody's blood boil, she was still very forgiving and was ready to do her duty and to help out in any way she could just still. I mean, I just can't imagine. So just the picture of, yeah, she's strong, she's independent, but she's also very moral. Uh, she's also very loving, very forgiving, very patient. Very, a, a hard worker, very just kind of looking to the positive of whatever situation that she's in, being the best version of herself that she can be in every situation. And then ultimately everything works out. So I love that. Um, the, my favorite line is, I have a lot of them, but of course the most famous iconic line, the last line where she says, reader, I married him, which I think sums up her character perfectly. And then the little like kind of follow up, you know, what happened afterwards. It's, it's all fantastic. Now this is again, written in 1847. What I love about this is that I can recommend this for any age because there's no spikes. And I love that because you feel the angst and uh, the great romance, maybe a little bit of like an unconventional romance too, not your typical like 
prince and princess, you know, there's some flaws at the end. There's health issues too. It's not just picture perfect, but you feel this just real, real love between them and passion. And there's no, there's no spice. So I love that about this book. I think she did such a great job with that. I heard or I read, I don't know if this is true, but she wrote this with a certain guy in mind that was just sort of out of her reach as well. And then later on when the book was published and it was popular, she got to meet him and it was just a total dud. <laughs> it wasn't uh, how she pictured it or how he thought he was going to be. I don't know if that's true or not. That must have been quite a letdown, but at least we got this book out of it before uh, she met him. It's fantastic. I love the morality. I love Helen's character where she talks about Christianity and the Bible because, you know, you can see kind of the cause and effect. Jane wasn't all that jazzed about the Christian faith, especially when the people who she sees, you know, modeling it, espousing it are just hypocrites or very cruel. Uh, but then you have that character, Helen, who not only talks the talk but truly walks the walk and i think it left such an impression on her and impacted her and she carried on you know that with her and so it's kind of like that for me too i feel like wow that really even helen's character made an impression on me and then seeing jane and her arc that also i feel like i carry it and i just there are certain elements of jane of helen that i also i want to be like and yeah, it's just always one of my favorite books. I will say that all of the movie adaptations and the shows are awful. I just, it's one of those things where it's never going to live up to the book. I've watched them all. None of, none of them do it justice. I don't like any of them. Uh, so that's that. The book is just always better. Okay, moving on. We're going to move on to another kind of similar book is... Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. Now, right away, it hooks you because it's got such great lines in the beginning, such as, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, which is very, very interesting. And another quote that I love too is, if you look for perfection, you'll never be content. So it's you can really kind of see the whole like Russian <laughs> mentality and aspect here. You feel like you are kind of in that time period, um, I love the writing. There's sort of two stories going on. You have the Levin storyline and then you have the Anna Karenina storyline. But for me, just the whole storyline of actual, you know, Anna Karenina and Count Roski. Sorry, I'm not pronouncing that right. That was to me the most fascinating part, especially because in the beginning, you see Anna trying to repair um, a familiar relationship where there was an infidelity and in the end she i don't think i'm giving anything any spoilers away here she ends up having an extramarital affair and or adultery let's just you know say call it for what it is and that love triangle you know with her husband and count Ronsky and her you you really see how it does a number on her psyche I see it as a great cautionary tale not to get even close to those types of situations because you see the cause and effect, you see the outcome, which in case you don't know, again, I don't want to spoil anything, but it is a tragic, awful, awful ending for her and really, you know, everybody who was involved in that situation. Yes, they go on to live their lives and repair and she doesn't. Am I giving it away? She ends up throwing herself on a train track. So some of the reasons why I really enjoy this book, even though it has some troubling themes, right, is it's got very compelling characters. The historical context is really interesting, just seeing what Russian life and, and the politics of it was in the 19th century. There's no spice in it, even though there's a lot of passion even though there's a lot of romance and passion there's no spice again which i really appreciate it this is this is one where it's more fade to black it's implied but then we kind of cut away whereas jane eyre there is none of that not even fade to black even though it doesn't have that level of spice i still wouldn't recommend it like for young ladies you know ladies that aren't married i don't know I, just me personally i think it's better for old married ladies like myself and as far as movie adaptations i've only seen the one with 
Kira Knightley and Jude Law and I don't know who else is on there but again the movies just never do the books justice. I found the movie incredibly boring but the book did not bore me so yeah it is what it is. I, I still again the book trumps the movie. All right, so book number three is Around the World in 80 Days, and this is by the very famous author as well, Jules Verne. This was published around the same time, 1873. Now, the character names are a little bit hard for me to pronounce, so forgive me if I pronounce them wrong, but the main character is Phileas Fogg. I never know if I'm saying that right, but he is the wealthy, reserved, very calm and stoic Englishman, and then he has his valet, which I'm not even gonna try, so am I gonna try to pass a part tilt? <laughs> I'm not gonna say it right. I could never say it right. It, great thing is when you're reading, it doesn't matter. Like you just read the word in your head. But anyhow, and then the woman that they end up rescuing, the Indian woman, the in, young Indian princess is Auda, A-O-U-D-A. -A -A. Again, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right. But the reason why I love this book and it forever stays with me and I want to be like Phileas Fogg, whatever his name is. I want to be like that character like him because he is just so determined focused but even when so many things derail his plans he has i want to say like an unrealistic positive upbeat attitude he's just very stoic just like okay you can't change it you can't fix it. like you can't go back in time and change things you can't help what's happening you deal with it and you move forward like you just keep on steady moving towards your goal and no matter what happened he was always just very stoic about it and kept on just very focused and but he would always also do what's right even if it meant derailing his plans like he wasn't so hyper focused to the detriment of himself or everybody around him which you know there are people like that he's more of the approach of yes i'm going to accomplish this but if i see something somebody that needs to be defended or something that needs to be taken care of i'm going to do the right thing first which is how he rescues that indian princess that story is just so crazy but <laughs> they end up rescuing her and again there's like no spice none of that but you can kind of feel this connection between them this passion so that again i don't want to ruin it but the very end when they finally acknowledge their feelings oh, it's just so awesome it's just so wonderful i love that i love that ending and just when you think all that for nothing bam you get the whole oh, but then you find out that one thing that happens when you travel around the world that made all the difference and the ending is just so awesome i feel like i went on a vacation around the world it's great for geography it's great for history social studies you can think of it that way and i'm not sure if this book is on the robinson curriculum book list i know for sure some jules verne books are maybe journey to the center of the earth i'm not sure but i don't know about this one but it's one of my personal favorites i highly recommend it I have the junior version, the classic starts that I give my kids to read when they're younger. I hope they pick this up. And I should have said this to begin with, the plot is that he has to win a bet where he has to travel around the world in 80 days. Now today, that's sort of a, that's easy. But again, this is set in the late 1800s. Travel around that time was very different than it is today. Now, as far as TV or film adaptations, I don't think I've seen any because the ones that are very old just look very ugh, cringy and I'm certainly not going to watch the Jackie Chan one because from just the trailer alone, it seems like they really deviated from the actual, I'm sorry, I just can't take the movie seriously <laughs> with the, is it Owen Wilson too? Like, I just can't, I can't with that movie, I don't even want to watch it. Uh, so again, I'm going to say, even though I haven't seen the movie, that I'm sure the book is better than the movie. All right, moving on to book number four. I will say I did like this movie. I don't think it's better than the book, but the movie wasn't bad. It wasn't terrible. It was Gone with the Wind by Margaret Mitchell. This is a book that I actually annotated, which 
I haven't done that with very many books, but I was I loved it so much that I went ahead and annotated it. This is a little bit more modern compared to the other ones. This was written in 1936, and it takes you through the history, the lead up, the actual war, and then the post reconstructive era of the Civil War. So we have Scarlett O'Hara, the main character, and then you know all her little love interests. But of course, Rhett Butler, he's he's the main guy there. And maybe again, because it's a strong female character, I don't know, I really enjoyed it. But I, I also liked her growth, her arc. And the ending is kind of a bummer. It's kind of sad. However, again, it's cause and effect. And you don't get to choose your outcomes. You know, you, you make your choices and then you have to deal with the consequences of it. So it's kind of like, um, like with punishments, like you tell kids, you know, you choose your actions, but you don't get to choose your consequences. And so that this is kind of a big picture reality of that. And Scarlet isn't really my favorite character in the story. I, I'm along for the ride and I'm curious to see what happens and I certainly feel for her in some moments and some moments I cry, some moments I'm cheering for her, some moments I just want to hit her over the head. I kind of go through it all with her. But my other favorite characters are number one, Scarlett's mom. It's just like hashtag mom goals. That's how I would like to be. But number two is Melanie Wilkes. I love her character. She's also somebody who I would just love to be more like. There's a scene where she's so like on the verge of death. I mean, she just went through it all with her pregnancy and having to evacuate town that night. I mean, it's like a crazy story, right? And she's just kind of trying to nurse herself back to health. I mean, just to be alive, really. She's teetering on the edge here. And something happens where she has to come to, well, she didn't have to come to Scarlett's rescue and Scarlett took care of it herself, but she was willing. Ah, every time I think about this scene, like I start to tear up how she came down with that sword. See, I'm going to do it again. Every time I think about that, I think it's just because how even even though Scarlett wasn't even that nice to her ever, they didn't have such a great relationship. It's sort of like that Jane Eyre thing. She was just so willing to lay down her life for her friend, you know, and even ill-equipped, you know, she was just ready to do that. Melanie is my favorite character in this book. And the ending, oh, her ending again, is just gonna make me cry. There's so many parts of this that moved me to tears. A lot of it has to do with Melanie. Um, also, there is like, um, you know, Scarlett's daughter. That is awful. All of it. Just there's there's a lot of tragedy, but there are like those little moments too. I don't really consider this just like a really sad book. Like there are books that I tell my kids, should I read this out loud to you guys again? And they're like, no, mom, that's a sad book, or no, mom, that's a sad movie. But I don't see uh, those movies or those books as just like a sad book or a sad movie. I see it as beautiful. It, it's hard to explain, right? I see it as um, just beautiful pieces of art that stir something inside of you. And so I definitely felt that with this. And I know it could be a little bit controversial, you know, the viewpoints. I think I've talked about this before, you know, it was kind of like the on the other side of the scope of maybe something like Uncle Tom's Cabin, you know, and all of that. I, I think it does a pretty good job of just showing what that perspective and point of view was during that time. And other people can have different points of view and experiences from that time point as well. And they're both valid, you know, and it's just a great way to just sort of understand each other, I think. Uh, so that, yeah, that's uh, all I'm going to say about Gone with the Wind. All right. And last but not least, we have number five, Pride and Prejudice by, by Jane Austen. Of course, another incredibly famous book. This is the oldest of all of these. This was written in 1813, right? Yes, 1813. And I love it because it's sort of that setting, English countryside. And it's really, again, just giving you that picture of what 
the roles look like at that time, you know, the emphasis on marriage and status and how much does somebody make a year, you know, all of those kinds of things. But what I love is, again, we have a headstrong character. I think I'm seeing a little theme here of um, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Bennett, and then you have her sisters that are more kind of, you know, the stereotypical young lady during that time period and what their goals are and what they want out of life. But Elizabeth, she's different. And I like that, you know, she wasn't like just seeking that so badly. That was her focus and that's all she ever wanted. You know, she wasn't boy crazy, but in the end, she did get that wonderful spouse, you know, Mr. Darcy, which of course it wasn't always so wonderful. There's a whole little song and dance there. I think they, they challenge each other. It's a great build up and sort of opposites attract and all of that. Uh, but I like that, you know, good things come to those who wait, but also who are busy doing other things. Like she's not just pining away, waiting for her Mr. Right. She's reading and she's doing things and she's, walking, exercising, walking to places, right? And you know, it sort of reminds me of Little Women as well. Do you get that sort of parallel? Uh, it reminds me of that with the sisters and Joe, you know, there's always that one that is a little bit different, maybe a little bit rebellious, you know, but always taking care of what needs to be taken care of, very much aware of their sense of duty and all of those things. Um, you know, but I like that, that she just wasn't boy crazy, but in the end, she got a great match. This is another novel too, where just like Anna Karenina, the first opening line is that really iconic line that draws you in. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. And that's sort of the arching theme, right, of the story. Now, when it comes to movie adaptations, I will say that this movie with Again, Akira Knightley, she's in a lot of these historical movies. Um, I did like that one. I thought it was good. I liked it. The, I still think the book is better than the movie, but the movie wasn't bad. And there is also, of course, no spice in this book. So it's a book that I can recommend to any young lady. All right, so those are my top five classic literary picks that just kind of stay with me and they'll forever be some of my favorites. Let me know in the comments down below what you think of any of these books. If you've read them, do you agree with my assessment or not? And let me know maybe of another classic that has really stayed with you. If you like this type of content, please let me know. Please give it a thumbs up. Now I will leave links for these books down below, including the Penguin cloth covers. These are some of my favorites. As you can see, I have a, a shelf of them back here. So uh, I buy them at Barnes and Noble, but I'll see if they're available on Amazon. Now, I think you would really like this video, but YouTube's algorithm thinks you would like this video instead. So whichever one you choose, I will see you there. Bye for now.